So in the last history video I did, guys, we were talking about the policy game and the Chicago outfit trying to muscle in on the numbers bracket, which is another name that the policy game went by. And allegedly, according to stuff that Sam Giancana said on wiretaps, killing a guy named Teddy Rowe, who was half Italian, half black, but who was the head of like the black syndicate that was involved in this particular form of gambling in the black community. And it was very lucrative, one of the most lucrative hustles in the city. The outfit eventually got that, okay? And they got it at a time when there was one particular guy on the rise in the ranks, and that's a guy who many of you guys have already heard of, Tony Accardo, street name Joe Batters. Also, the media dubbed him Big Tuna. Uh, that wasn't really anything that had anything to do with the streets. It was because he had caught a tuna one time and taken a photo with it. But uh, Joe Batters was his street name. That was a street name given to him by Al Capone. So in this video, I'm going to talk about him personally, but I'm also going to talk more about the development of the outfit and the hustles that they got into during the time that he was in power. And he kind of went in and out of the top position while he was running things uh, for a variety of reasons. But he was either the boss or the underboss or the consigliere, like almost, I would say about 50 years. Okay, so he was like either the top guy or one of the top guys in the Chicago outfit for really from like the 40s all the way to his death in the early 90s and 92. And this is a video that's uh, very close to home, by the way, because as you guys have heard me mention in videos before, neighborhood I was born, Harlem Avenue in diversity, that is the border of Chicago and a suburb called Elmwood Park, which was the territory of the mob. I don't know if too many of those guys still stay over there, but it was there was an outfit crew that was over there. And a lot of my neighbors in that neighborhood, we're talking early 80s now, were outfit members. So we were living over there, and uh, we I never saw Tony Accardo personally, at least I don't remember seeing him, but a lot of the guys who worked for him uh, lived around me. And one of my neighbors, a guy named Ken Ito, who actually wasn't Italian, he was Japanese, you guys may have uh, heard of him. His street name was Tokyo Joe. He was shot at the, by the down the street from my house. Right? He actually survived that though. He was he was not killed in that hit attempt. So when I eventually learned more about this, it was just interesting because, you know, some of these guys, it's hard to know where the order came from on some of this stuff, you know, for me, um, when you're outside that circle. But anyways, Tony Accardo, he was born all the way back in, in 1906. And uh, he was the son of Italian immigrants. He was born here on American soil. He, was, he himself was not immigrating this first generation. His parents immigrated from a region of Sicily called Trapani. I think Castle de Trano was the, was the village where they immigrated from. And they were not criminals. They, they were not leading any type of criminal lifestyle. His father was a shoemaker. I don't know if his mother worked, but uh, they were poor. They were, you know, making, I mean, they were, he was making ends meet his dad, but he definitely wasn't making bank by any stretch of the imagination. And they lived on the near west side of Chicago, which at that time was you know, a lot of European immigrants. Uh, now that's, that's predominantly black, but back then it was, it was mainly European immigrants. He dropped out of school at 14 and why he chose to drop out of school. I don't know. Um, but he chose, he dropped out and he just kind of started like hanging around uh, the neighborhood at places where guys would hang out. And, uh, he eventually joined a gang. Now, this is a, a street gang we're talking about. Not This was not organized crime. And it's a gang that no longer exists, like a lot of the gangs back then. It was called the Circus Cafe Gang. Now, a lot of these gangs that the Europeans had back then were really, like, the, the organized crime that the adults were involved in would, like, recruit from these street gangs, okay? like So, like, the top gang bangers that they saw amongst the younger people they would come and ask them to join like the mafia and the, the higher up gangs. So Tony Accardo was eventually approached by, you know, members of Capone's gang. And he eventually became part of the Chicago outfit. Now the Chicago outfit had originated just a little bit after Accardo was born. Uh, it had changed. Big Jim Colosimo had his gang, but then, you know, it changed into the outfit around 1910. Now this was a time when Italians were coming over in large waves and, you know, the organized crime thing was a very controversial issue in the Italian community. If you haven't seen my video that I did on the group that the Italians called the White Hand and their efforts to combat the mafia, go and check that out because 
it shows you that like not everyone in the Italian community, and in fact, large numbers of people in the Italian community were not cool with you know the development of the mob and the way that things were going because it was creating a stereotype about Italians in American culture that was very negative. And, you know, they were getting harassed by the police and they were getting uh, discriminated against by Americans. The mafia was causing a lot of like backlash in American culture against them. So a lot of Italians were not cool with that. So they were attempting to combat this legally for a while. But by, you know, by the time that the, the prohibition era was really taking off and the bootlegging thing, they had to surrender it because the criminals were winning i mean they were basically taking control they had the you know the whole not only the italian community but like the whole european immigrant community like in a headlock they had the police on their payroll politicians and in some ways they were even more powerful than the government so you know it, it eventually was something that you know a lot of italians didn't like but that was the way things went so accardo he got recruited into the outfit around this time and uh, he became like a, you know, a soldier for them. He got the nickname Joe Batters from Capone for allegedly killing three guys. Now, what exactly these guys did, I'm not sure. They had somehow gone against the outfit. And Tony Accardo apparently killed them with a baseball bat. At least he was never convicted of this. Okay, he was never, I don't believe he was even charged with this, uh, let alone convicted, but he allegedly killed him with a baseball bat, and so Capone said, this kid's a real Joe Batters, and that became his street name. Now, Accardo did something when he was in his late 20s that a lot of uh, Italians in the outfit were doing at that time, and his reasons for this, I don't know, but uh, he married a, a Polish woman. Uh, her name was Clarice. I think Porzani was her last name or something like that. For any Polish people, if I'm pronouncing that wrong. A lot of Italians, like Capone had married a, you know, an Irish woman, a lot of them were marrying non-Italians. There was a rule in the outfit that you had to be Italian to become a made guy. So what I've heard is that a lot of outfit members did not want their kids to be doing this. So they would deliberately marry non-Italians so that their kids could not become made guys. That's what I've heard. I've never read that anywhere. It's just like, that's what I heard they used to do. Uh, I don't know if that's the reason Ricardo married a Polish woman or not. Two of his kids that he eventually ended up raising were actually adopted. He had two, I believe he had two with uh, his Polish wife, and then uh, he adopted two others. But anyway, so he did that when he was in his late 20s. But eventually, as you guys know, Capone got sent away for 11 years. At that point, Frank Nitti took over for a while. He was like the enforcer. Frank Nitti, though, he eventually committed suicide, and he committed suicide because he was claustrophobic and he was going to be sent back to jail and he was afraid of being in a small space. It was taken over at that point by Paul the Waiter Rica, who I had mentioned in the previous video on the, on the policy racket. So Paul Rica had Accardo like as his underboss. Okay, so at this point, Accardo was like number two. Now, this was a time when they were trying to get a lot of new hustles. They were muscling in on the Blacks with the policy game. The Blacks were running the numbers racket, and that was like one of the best rackets. So they were trying to, you know, get that from the Blacks, and they were killing people, kidnapping people, like, you know, in the Black community to try and get that. And they eventually did get it. After, uh, well, the Jones brothers, who had first been running it, fled to Mexico. And then Teddy Rowe took it over from them. He was actually half Italian himself, but the, the mob, according to Sam Giancana, killed him. So then they took it over. Now they were also getting in on another hustle, which possibly led to their downfall. You know, it depends on how you look at this. Historians can debate this. But that hustle, as you guys already know, was narcotics. And this is something that, you know, has been discussed in like popular culture. Uh, you know, in movies, like guys predicted that the, the drug business would be the downfall of the mafia. And in some ways, I, I think you can look at it like that, but at any rate, they were greatly trying to expand uh, narcotic smuggling during this time period. In real life, I've never heard of any outfit bosses being hesitant about getting into the dope game. It, it wasn't even a question. This is going to make a lot of money or getting into it, like period. There was no, like, this is a dirty business. This might hurt people, hurt kids. There was none of that. It was just like, the money's there. We're going for it. That's what I've heard. I don't know, that might have been said in meetings or whatever, but uh, publicly I've never heard anything like that. 
So they get out on this on the dope game. And the problem with the dope game, as you guys already know, is that you're dealing with a lot of people. And I mean from the top down. That you can't really trust to keep their mouth shut, right? I mean, you're dealing with a lot of people who are not solid. And you are dealing with police that have a lot of financial gain possible, okay, by taking money from these drug dealers. You can't trust them to keep their mouth shut. So you're really bringing a lot of people under the umbrella of this racket that are not like directly connected to the outfit. And you're increasing the possibility that you're going to get snitched on. But not only that, the dope game was causing a tremendous amount of like damage to the community. I mean, directly like the people's lives, it was tearing apart families and everything. So you arouse the anger and the, the resistance from like the activist community. And the activist community gets a lot of publicity. And publicity is really bad for business, right? If you're in the outfit. So the dope game in one way, you can look at this as like something that led to their downfall. But anyways, so Accardo, he started, you know, getting into this with Rika. Him and Rika were really running it at this time. This is like in the 40s now. So Accardo is like in his 30s, 40s. Now, just as an added side note, guys, I had mentioned the three murders that Accardo allegedly committed with a baseball bat. How many murders he committed in total is unknown. He was talking on wiretap uh, that the FBI overheard about allegedly participating in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and in the murder of Frankie Yale, okay, who was another mob boss from Brooklyn. The law enforcement community generally considers this to be cap. They think he was capping, like that he didn't really actually participate in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That's, they think he was lying. Okay, now whether or not he really did or, or didn't participate in that is something that we may never know in history. He was saying he did, but there are reasons. I'd, I'd be interested in knowing the FBI's reasons for thinking that he's lying about that. But you can't always take what these mob guys say to be the truth. Like even when it's being said in private, like you got to take some of it with a grain of salt. Accardo eventually became the top guy in the outfit when Rika got sent to jail. He got a 10-year sentence. Now this was a sentence that came as part of a scandal that involved Hollywood movie studios. And what the outfit was doing, they had a lot of these hustles that you don't really see a lot, you know, a lot of organized crime doing today. Um, what they were doing was they were using the threat of going on strike uh, to basically extort money from Hollywood studios. So the, the mob controlled the labor unions, okay? And so they would say, okay, we're gonna get the laborers, the workers to strike, go on strike and stop working if you don't pay us. Okay, so it was like extortion from these from these studios. Uh, so a lot of guys got convicted of that. Okay, and that was one of the things that uh, helped Picardo to move into the top spot. So Rika got sentenced to 10 years uh, as part of that Hollywood thing. And then Picardo became the boss. Now, if Rika was actually still running things from jail, I don't know, or from prison, but uh, Rika was prevented from having any contact with the mafia. Uh, this was like part of his parole. Now, whether or not he actually was still having contact with them, you know, we don't know. But Accardo was officially the boss of the outfit at this point. Uh, now, you know, some people think that he was still really running things like with Rika. So it was like two bosses at the top. Accardo started getting them into a lot of different hustles. Okay, one was slot machines. Another one was vending machines. And I remember this was decades ago. I was thinking about going into the vending machine business. And uh, my uncle told me, he said, you better know somebody if you're going to go into that business because that's like run by the mob. So I don't know how long they actually controlled that, but vending machines was one, one thing that they were going into. Uh, they were also making fake stamps to basically charge tax for liquor and cigarettes. And uh, then they were also doing the dope thing. They were really expanding the, the narcotics. Ricardo was getting these gambling machines into all types of business establishments. Okay, gas stations, bars, restaurants. He was putting these things, he was putting these things everywhere. Now, the mob also from Chicago, I should mention, you know, it's, it's really like a separate organization from the mob from New York. Okay, it's all like Italian mafia, but it's two, two separate organizations, actually, I mean, you could consider the five families all separate organizations over in New York, but they at first were running things out in Las Vegas, 
but the Chicago outfit eventually took that over from them. Okay, so they were kind of like in competition for that. The the mob from Chicago eventually got it, and they eventually took over pretty much all of the hustles as far as like mafia hustles in the entire western half of the United States. And they became really, in some ways, the most powerful organized criminal organization in the world. Uh, I mean, they were extremely powerful. In some ways, they had even more power, power than the government, you know, in some localities. So, Accardo also went back to bootlegging in states where alcohol was illegal. Uh, and examples of this were Kansas and Oklahoma. Another thing that he did, he kind of changed the, the prostitution hustle. So, I had talked about Big Jim Colosimo and how he was really engaging in human trafficking, you know, with some of these girls, like kidnapping some of these girls and then making them into sex slaves. That was like a really bad look, you know, for for Italian organized crime. So Accardo, he got rid of the brothels and he changed it into like a call girl service. Okay, so it's still prostitution. If they were still doing any of the human trafficking thing, I don't know. I don't think they were, honestly. If they were, that's never really been uncovered as far as I know. But uh, now another thing that he did, he started to get rid of some of the labor racketeering and also some of the extortion. You know, a lot of times when people extort money, they're doing it from people that are not involved in the streets. And so you risk prosecution. And Accardo was very careful about avoiding prosecution. He was trying to keep a very low profile. So was Rika. Rika was trying to keep a low profile too. They had an underboss, though, another guy who was part of the outfit with them, who I mentioned in the previous video, who was not at all keeping a low profile, and that, as you guys know, is Sam Giancana. He was he was a, a widower. His wife had died. And so he was single, okay? And so he was hitting the nightclubs, and he, was, he started to date, like, a really high-profile singer named Phyllis McGuire. And this was attracting a lot of attention. Now, Accardo and Rico were letting him take the attention, but they were, you know, more like Carlo Gambino out in New York, whereas they were trying to keep everything very low key. And anything that started to attract attention from the IRS or the FBI, they were willing to let it go. Um, and Accardo, in his entire life, only spent possibly one night in jail and possibly not even that. Um, so he never ended up going to prison or even jail. Uh, he, he never had like any, he, he was never sitting in the county for months or nothing. Was free his entire life. And he was always very, very low key. He was very much against uh, Italian celebrities bringing up the mafia or using the mafia for clout or attention or anything like that. Clout chasing based off of his organization was a big no-no. There was one time when there were two pro wrestlers uh, one of them it was named Lou Albano, and the other one's name was Tony Altamari. They were they took on like a mafia themed wrestling persona. They called themselves the Sicilians, and uh, Accardo told them to get rid of this, to, to stop calling themselves that, because he was like, you, you know, this is I don't know his exact words, but it was creating publicity for the mob, which he did not want. Okay, and you got to remember, this is a time in America when a lot of the mob movies, you know, that we know today were, had not come out yet. So in some ways, it was something that, you know, you had to be part of the circle to know exactly what was going on and how they did business. Because a lot of that stuff had not happened yet. A lot of that exposure had not come yet. So he was trying to keep that from happening. He eventually, though, in the late 50s, started to get a lot of attention from the IRS. And so he gave his position up to Giancana and let Giancana be the boss. So he stepped down and became... Uh, conciliary, which, as some of you guys may know, is basically like a counselor, like the person who gives advice. And Giancana was taking all the heat. Now, Giancana eventually started to be a problem for the mafia, okay? Not only was he living this high-profile lifestyle, you know, like Gotti did later in the 90s and like Capone had done, and not only was he doing too many things publicly and, you know, dating this high-profile woman and everything, but he was not sharing the wealth, okay, uh, as much as really he should have been doing. There were casinos that they had in other countries. Now, one of these other countries was Iran, and then they also had casinos in Central American countries. 
and he wasn't giving money like he wasn't sharing any of this money with the guys who were like down below him at the, at the soldier level Ricardo and Rica eventually replaced him with Joey Doe's Ayupa and this is a guy who you guys may have heard me mention in videos this was another like top mob guy who doesn't really come into this story too much but they eventually replaced uh, Giancana with him uh, so Giancana went to Mexico he eventually got kicked out of Mexico he came back to Illinois he was at home in Oak Park this is in 1975 in, in the summer as I mentioned at the end of the last video about the policy racket and he was making sausage and somebody killed him now that was in 1975 three years before that Rika had actually died so after Gene kind of died Accardo was the top guy okay he was like the top authority in the outfit and there was nobody else even close to him and this was a time when the outfit was like I said you know one of the if not the most powerful uh, criminal organization there's a particular incident that uh again he was never convicted of but a lot of people know about him and this is a really famous incident so he had a home out in the suburb of river forest which is a really nice suburb to the west of chicago and he was on vacation in california okay his home during that time was burglarized now why they decided to burglarize tony Ricardo's house the boss of the mafia I don't know I don't know why they tried to do this but the guys who were suspected of doing it there were three of them and then there were four other people who were somehow connected with them they were found strangled and their throats had been slit and the cops the FBI they thought that Ocardo had ordered these hits because of the burglary so that eventually was brought to light in the family secrets trial in the family secrets trial some of you may have heard me refer to in, in other videos this is a very well-known trial when a lot of top mafia guys went down there was a hit man named nick calabrese who i did a separate video on when he died uh, that video was like a couple months back on my channel he had allegedly participated in those in those hits okay of those uh of those thieves so everybody that had killed those thieves were all convicted in that trial and uh nick calabrese you know he cooperated with the government so uh, he didn't get a super long prison term but a lot of guys you know who participated in that got super long prison terms so according to him the fbi's theory turned out to be uh, correct but a problem that he had his official uh title like his official job was that he was a beer salesman but he was living in this mansion and you know had all this nice expensive stuff so the irs was on him okay and you know when you're making all this illegal money this is one thing the guys in the streets you know that are making like millions of dollars have to deal with is that is that you can't spend the money because if you don't have a job and you're spending all this money you're going to attract attention from the government so Ocardo moved out of his mansion and he moved into a smaller house uh in river forest he put a vault in that house and then he bought another home out in in uh, California in, in Palm Springs and he would fly back and forth from Chicago to uh, California but he started getting involved in a lot of legitimate businesses and this is something that the mob uh, has done like in, until this day so some of these legitimate investments that he had he was in office buildings retail uh, centers lumber farms paper factories hotels car dealerships trucking companies newspaper companies restaurants and travel agencies he may have had other investments as well uh, a lot of these mafia guys had investments in all type of legitimate businesses so i mean you've got like money coming in from every angle you know and, and like a lot of money so he eventually moved to barrington hills which is another uh, town in illinois and he was living there with a couple of his relatives he eventually died in 92. he was never convicted of any crime and uh there was one particular time when he was at, at like some hearing and he kept on just declining the answer again and again and again and uh never never got taken down by the law so let me know what you think in the comment section guys tony Ricardo, man any personal stories you guys have with uh, him or any of his guys he presided over a period in the mob's history when a lot of violence was going on they were doing a lot of hits I mean blood was flowing in the streets left and right and a lot of these people were people that 
you know, were part of their own circle. I mean, it was like their own, their own guys, like the, like the slang goes today, uh, Italian beef. It's like in-house beef. So if you join the mob, you know, the odds that you could be whacked, even if you didn't do anything wrong, were there. I'm not going to say that they were high, but, you know, if, if you were just, you know, potentially a problem or if, you know, something was suspected about you, even if it couldn't be proven, you might just be, get a bullet in the head at some meeting when everybody's smiling in your face, shaking your hand, and then all of a sudden you're just gone. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this kind of stuff, uh... It was one of the things that, you know, really kind of turned me off. I was like, man, you know, they're, you know, shaking this guy's hand, calling him brother and stuff. And then the next second they're gone. And, you know, what, whatever the guy supposedly did might not have even been true. I'm not sure if it could have continued in the present day, you know what I'm saying? Because with all the technology that they have today and uh, with all the people that uh, are snitching today and stuff, uh, I'm not sure that uh, th this would have been able to continue, but I'm not, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, the cartels are still going today and the cartels are doing a lot of violent stuff like that, too. But uh, a lot of the mafia families and stuff in, in Italy and stuff have morphed more into cartels than into what the outfit was, you know, because when, when they got their hands in too many uh, cookie jars, it starts to it just attracts too much attention and, uh, and it involves innocent people. You know what I'm saying? Like you're involving business owners, extorting from them and stuff. And these are people who didn't ask to be part of this, you know what I'm saying? And then they got to live by the code. And it's the same thing that you see in the streets with a lot of the street gangs, expecting innocent civilians to live by a street code that they didn't even sign up to live by. And then if they don't live by it, they get whacked. And then the same guys who, you know, are enforcing this, the guys who are in the streets, a lot of times they don't live by the code and then they don't get whacked. They go to prison or they get a deal, you know, go into witness protection and, you know, they just whack, you know, the, these guys that were just innocent neutrons, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, the whole thing is really hypocritical, but it's a different era. And these guys today got to stay real low because, I mean, the feds are super, I mean, they hawk their every move. So they, they got to stay real low today. Uh, if they're even still, you know, doing any of the stuff they were doing back then. But anyways, you guys let me know what you think, though, in the comment section, man. There's your boy, Winnie Sea Report. I know.